morning, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming out to District 7's Budget Town Hall. Um, what does a town hall mean? Um, you're all going to be able to ask questions because, because we have a lot of staff. I think our ratio staff to resident might be three to one right now. Is that, is that true? Woo! You're, you're going to be able to ask all the questions. Well, okay, I shouldn't commit you guys to, to doing that, but I think we're going to be able to have time for a good discussion uh, today. My name is Ana Sandoval. I am one of the 10 council members or one of the 11 council members for the city of San Antonio. The area I represent is District 7. That's where you are right now. Welcome. Uh, even if you don't live in District 7, all of you are welcome here. Um, we're um, open borders in, in District 7. So... Um, Today what you'll hear is a presentation from city management on the proposed budget for the next fiscal year. It runs from October 1 to September 30th of the following year. And um, I, there, this is the 10th one, I think. Is that right, Maria? Where's Maria? The 10th one. So maybe the public is burnt out from... <laughs> town hall meetings, but staff is not burnt out. They saved all their energy for this last, or a lot of their energy for this last meeting. Right, 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 right. Can I hear it? Stormwater, can I hear it from Stormwater? All right, okay. What other departments do we have here? ACS, Animal Care Services, yeah. Oh, developments, are, code compliance is here. All right, okay. Yeah, so, solid waste is solid. Oh, the library is here. Where, <gasps> public health, that's a big one. Parks, parks. All right, what, what else do we have here? <gasps> Neighborhood and housing services, human services. Oh, is this city attorney here? All right, we are not getting in trouble tonight. <laughs> Okay. Um, anyway, thank you again for, for being here. There's some very exciting new things in the budget. There's some new and improved things in the budget. Um, and we are truly, truly blessed because we have both the city manager and the deputy city manager and an assistant city manager with us today. That means, um, yeah, that he just walked into the room. You can't miss him. Um, that means that um, they can make some decisions. Well, council ultimately has to approve, but they can make a lot of decisions too. Um, and I, is it okay if I recognize the department directors that are here, just so you guys know who runs which department. So health is run by Claude Jacob right behind you. Welcome, Claude. He's been here about a year now, I would say. All right. Thank you, Claude, for being here. Uh, solid waste, or in other words, garbage and recycling and organics pickup is run by David Newman. And... Um, Animal Care Services, we have a fairly new director, but he has been around for a long time. Shannon Sims, thank you for being with us. And we have an acting assistant director of Stormwater, and that is Robert Reyna. Thank you. You can stand up because, all right. Oh, okay, Public Works, sorry, okay. And, all right, and we've got a couple neighborhoods represent. I can go on, but I'll, I'll stop in a minute. Um, we have a few neighborhoods represented here. Can I hear what neighborhoods are here tonight? Ingram Hills, all right, they're actually very close. They're a, a fun bunch, all right, Ingram Hills right here. Come on, I know there's one more. I see three residents from that neighborhood. Oh. Thank you, Don. Um, Come on, there's one more. Monticello Park Neighborhood Association. Exactly. Ooh, ooh. Uh, it's not just you guys. There's someone back there, Miss Bianca Maldonado from, um, from MPNA. All right. I think I've pretty much run the gamut of what I can um, BS about while I'm up here. Um, so I introduce to you um, Ms. Maria Villagomez. She's the deputy city manager. She knows the budget forwards and backwards, and she will start the presentation for tonight, and Eric will be here soon for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman, and uh, hello, everyone. Again, my, my name is Maria Villagomez. I'm the, the deputy city manager, and it's an honor to be here with District 7. Uh, también para las personas que necesitan escuchar esta presentación en español, tenemos intérpretes. Um, allá atrás, eh, si necesitan ayuda, ellos tienen audífonos para que lo puedan escuchar. So, what we are going to do today is to give you an overview of the city's fiscal year 2023 proposed budget 
The city has a fiscal year that begins October 1 and ends September 30th, so the fiscal year 22 is quickly ending at the end of this month. So city council has been in conversations about the budget for the 2023 fiscal year that will begin October 1 since April. We had um, meetings with the council to get their policy direction on what their priorities were for the budget. We also came to the community and asked for your priorities. So what we are presenting to you today reflects your priorities. Now, this is not a done deal. Uh, we are uh, doing meetings across the city, as the councilwoman mentioned. This is the last um, community meeting. We also have another public meeting coming up next week that you can participate in. And then the city council will consider the approval of the budget on September 15. So the feedback that we're getting from the community at all of these meetings, the, the city council is taking that into account before they finalize the budget. So please tell us what you think tonight so the councilwoman can hear from you before she makes that final vote. So the budget, as I mentioned, incorporates the, the, the priorities of, of the council and the community. We are giving money back to the residents and I'll explain how we are doing that. We are also investing in the retention and recruitment of our city employees. The city of San Antonio, just like any other employer because of the pandemic and the uh, economic challenges that we have faced, uh, we had a high vacancy rate. So we are making adjustments to the budget to make sure that we stay competitive with the market. And we're also making significant investments in infrastructure and other um, areas of our community. So let me start with the survey that we did uh, back in May. And what you have in front of you are the citywide results on the left-hand side. We had about 11, more than 11,000 residents who participated. And you see the, the top five priorities, uh, property tax relief, police, fire and EMS, streets, parks and recreation. On the right-hand side, you'll see what were the priorities for District 7 Pretty much the same with the exception of affordable housing, uh, which was a priority for District 7, was not included in the top five. So you'll hear as part of this presentation what we are incorporating for affordable housing that addresses uh, those residents uh, like yourselves that indicated that was a priority. So the total city budget for fiscal year 23 is $3.4 billion. Three major components that make up this, uh, your, your budget is our general fund, which is the largest operating budget of the city, $1.5 billion. This supports most of the services that you expect from local government, like public safety, um, animal care services, code enforcement, the libraries, Metro Health. We also have what we call restricted funds, and those are restricted either by federal law, state law, or local ordinances. To give you an example, your garbage fee that you pay on your CPS bill on a monthly basis, that is restricted. It can only be used to pick up trash, brush collection, and recycling. So that's an example of a restricted fund. The capital program, which is $641 million, represents capital improvements that were approved by the voters, like the most recent 2022 uh, bond program that was approved by the voters in May. We also have some projects for the airport and other city facilities uh, like fire stations uh, that are incorporated in that budget. So now let me tell you a little bit more about the general fund. In this presentation, we'll be focused on that particular operating fund. As I mentioned, one and a half billion dollars. The graphic that you see before you incorporates both the revenues that come into the general fund and also how we invest those dollars. So the outer circle are those revenues, uh, four major components, uh, including our CPS uh, payment. We are the owners of CPS and we get, um, as a return on investment, about 14% of the gross revenues from CPS. So that makes up about 26% of our general fund budget. Property taxes is another large component at 28.8% of the general fund. We also have sales tax that is about a quarter of our general fund. 
and then other resources like EMS transport, transport fees, traffic fines, uh, and other user fees. Now, the way that we invest these dollars, which is the inner circle of the graphic, as you can see, our public safety departments, police and fire, make up close to 61% of our general fund. And we also have other important services in the general fund, like public works, parks and recreation, and many other services, including Metro Health, Municipal Court, uh, the library, code enforcement, animal care, uh, and some of the administration of the city. So now let's talk about your budget priorities, starting with property tax relief. One of the things that was very important for the city council uh, as we started conversations with them back in April was to ensure that there was property tax relief to all of our residents in San Antonio. Now, to give you some context of the property taxes that you pay, for every dollar that you pay on property taxes, the city of San Antonio gets about 20 cents or 20 percent. The balance of your property taxes is distributed to the school system, uh, to the Bear County, uh, to the University Health District, and other tax entities. So what I'm going to share with you today is specifically about the city of San Antonio, that 20% that you pay on your property taxes. So what we are doing in this, in this budget is that we're increasing the homestead exemption. The current homestead exemption is about $5,000 on your property value. We're increasing that to 10% of your value. So if your home is valued at $150,000, that exemption is going to go up from $5,000 to $15,000. So that's, that's a, a significant increment. Also, for those individuals that qualify for the disabled person exemption, that exemption is increasing from $12,500 to $85,000. And the over 65 exemption for those residents that are age uh, 65 or above, the exemption goes up from $65,000 to $85,000. In addition to that, uh, the city of San Antonio offers what we call a property tax freeze to those individuals over the age of 65 and disabled. So that means that when you get to age 65, the, the uh, over 65 exemption applies, so you get that uh, exemption of $85,000, and then your, your city property taxes are frozen. That means that if the value of your home continues to go up, your property taxes remain the same as they were when you turned 65. So all that combined, uh, the city will provide property tax relief to our residents in the amount of $95 million in uh, 2023. That's an increment of about $20 million from where we are today. Another area within the, the city property tax rate is that we are proposing a reduction to the property tax rate to the city portion of 1.67 uh, cents. And that applies to all residents and also all businesses. So everybody who pays uh, uh, property taxes to the city of San Antonio will see that reduction on the property tax rate. So that is one way that the city of San Antonio is giving money back to the residents. The other area is through a proposed customer energy credit. You may recall I mentioned earlier that the city of San Antonio is the owner of CPS and we get 14% of their gross uh, revenues. So with what, what, what happened this year is because of gas prices being much higher than what we had anticipated because of fuel um, issues that are happening in, in Europe, as well as the very warm weather that we have experienced here in San Antonio, our CPS revenues are projected to be $75 million higher than what we had anticipated in the budget. So when we did our mid-year review with the city council, we were anticipating about $35 million ahead. We have experienced a record number of days uh, with temperatures over 100 degrees. So with that, uh, that projection increased to be, as I mentioned, $75 million ahead of budget. So what the city manager is recommending is to give $50 million back to the rate payers 
the same way that the, those um, revenues were paid, we are proposing to give them back to the residents in two ways. The current proposal is $5 million for those low-income residential customers that qualified through a program with CPS that is called REAP. And $45 million is accredited to all the, the energy customers. On the residential side, that equates to about a credit of $31 that is proposed on the October bill. Now, the City Council has had a couple of meetings just on this topic, so this is not a done deal. Um, they have different ideas, perhaps, on how, how to utilize these dollars. So that, that discussion will continue before the budget is approved on September 15th. So in the next couple of weeks, the City Council will continue to deliberate. So that's another way that we're giving money back to the community. Now another, another priority is public safety. So I'm gonna start with the police uh, department. So what we are proposing in the budget is to add a total of 78 new police officers. We're applying for a grant to obtain 50 officers with the Department of Justice, and the budget includes the match that is required in that grant, or $3.6 million. We should know if we get the grant in September, uh, later this month. If we don't get the grant, then we will add a total of 38 uh, police officers with the monies that we budgeted as the, as the grant match. Now, what um, the Chief McManus is proposing on the utilization of this additional resources, San Antonio, just like any other uh, city in the country, we have experienced an increase in crime. So in order to address that, uh, Chief McManus is working with UTSA to develop a plan that will address violent crime in our city. So the recommendation is to assign those 50 police officers to address violent crime in our community once the study is completed in the fall. In addition to those 50 officers, we're also recommending the addition of 28 police uh, positions, police supervisors, for a new uh, um, police station that we're gonna be opening at the beginning of 2024. This was a uh, capital project that was approved in the 2017 bond program. It's currently um, under design and will start construction in 2023. So we need 28 additional positions when we open that new police uh, station and seven civilian positions. We also have funds in the uh, budget for a collective bargaining agreement with the Police Officers Association. And it's also a time for us to replace the in-car video systems that we have in our police vehicles. So we're um, budgeting $1.7 million to be able to do that. So the next area that I wanna cover is the fire department. So public safety, as I mentioned, um, police and fire were priorities of our community. So in the budget, we are adding a total of um, uh, 21 new uh, positions for the fire department. We are opening a fire station that was replaced in, in the border of District 2 and District 10, Fire Station 24. We anticipate that that's gonna be completed probably October, November of 2022 and we're adding a medical first responder unit uh, to be able to augment the medical services that are provided by our fire department. So there's six positions that we're adding for that. We're also adding a ladder company. A ladder company is one of those big trucks that you see our firefighters utilizing. We're adding one of those, and with that, we need to add 50 new firefighters. So that is also included in the budget. And finally, we have resources also for the collective bargaining agreement with um, the, the fire association. So I'm gonna transition now to another priority of the community, which is infrastructure. $154.4 million is included. This is roughly $13 million higher than what we have in the current budget. And this includes important projects, street maintenance, sidewalks, pavement markings, alley maintenance. I know alley maintenance is a priority for District 7. So on this next slide, you see some of the projects, just a few of the projects that are included in the infrastructure maintenance uh, program. 
This program is managed by Public Works, and if you have any questions about any other projects in your district, uh, Robert, Reina uh, will be able to assist you tonight. So now let's talk about affordable housing, and affordable housing was one of the top five priorities in District 7. So there's a total of $136 million in 2023 in the budget. This will allow us to address 2,500 housing units uh, with, uh, with this funding to be able to address affordable housing needs in our community. The, the city council is very committed to continue investment in affordable housing. So over the next five years, we're gonna be investing over $300 million in affordable housing. A combination of what was approved in the 2022 bond program, $150 million, some federal dollars, as well as the general fund. So let me trans transition now to parks and recreation. Uh, the city of San Antonio has over 200 parks across um, the entire city. So we're investing close to $20 million to address renovations at some of our uh, park facilities, uh, 17 facilities in total. Uh, we also are including $10 million to continue the program of purchasing uh, land over the Edwards Aquifer, or what we call the Edwards Aquifer Protection Program. And we also have some funds to enhance our summer youth uh, programming that we offer every year. So moving on to public health. Uh, public health, uh, as a result of COVID-19, there's an emphasis on the services provided by our department. And um, they, the Metro Health Department, developed a plan that is called the SA Forward Plan. So this plan was envisioned to be funded partially by federal grants, and as those grants were phasing out, we were transitioning those expenses into the general fund. So $3.8 million is being transitioned into the general fund to make those programs permanent in the city's budget. We also have a partnership with UT, the UT School of Public Health in San Antonio. Um, to develop the next generation of public health leaders. We have experienced a high demand for those positions that work in public health. So we want to work with, um, with UT to be able to ensure that we have individuals that are ready to take on the, the demands of our community. So now I'm gonna transition to the library. $4.7 million is being added to renovate eight library facilities. Um, and also to increase the library book budget. So if you go to our libraries and you check out books or digital materials, we're adding one and a half million dollars. So in total, we'll have about $6.7 million for books and materials. In the area of human services, one of the, the challenges that we um, had with the pandemic, and it continues to be a challenge, is homelessness. So we received some federal grants from the government during the pandemic to address some of the needs of the community. So we created a program where we have um, outreach workers trying to connect the homeless population to services, as well as a hotline that people can call and get assistance. So what we are recommending is to transition that into the general fund so we can make that a permanent um, program of the city now that the federal dollars have um, expired. We also, uh, during the pandemic, we had a couple of hotels that we use as temporary shelter for uh, the own shelter population. One of those hotels closed, uh, but we still have one that is open, it's in the downtown area, and we're recommending that we continue with that hotel till the end of December. So there's six months of additional funding for the lease of the hotel, has about 45 rooms, uh, but it has been helpful as we're trying to transition individuals out of the streets into um, a, a more uh, permanent housing. Um, we also have uh, services added for our seniors. We have a program that is called Older Adult Technology Services to provide technology assistance to our seniors, as well as programming within our Human Services Department. 
So finally, our capital budget. As I mentioned, $641 million, and you can see on the screen that it's made up of projects uh, related to streets, parks, drainage, air transportation, municipal facilities. Uh, we have um, fire stations included and also um, uh, police facilities. So to share with you some of the projects in District 7, there's a list of the 17 projects that were approved in the 2022 bond program that was approved by the voters in May. Uh, this represents the spending plan of $88 million over the next five years. That's an investment here in District 7. So this is just to share with you how we plan to execute those um, projects. So the next steps in the budget process, as you can see from this graphic, uh, we started work sessions with the council beginning in August 16. The last one is September 14. We started our community input process on August 15. Today is the last um, public meeting that we have out in the community. We also have two public hearings uh, at city council chambers. One was yesterday and the other one is next week on September the 8th. And finally, the city council will consider the budget on September 15. So that concludes my presentation and I'm gonna turn it over to Laura. If you have any questions about the budget, just raise your hand and Laura will pass the microphone and the team and myself are here to address any questions that, that you may have. Thank you, Maria. And just a quick note too, if you're in the room, you can scan this QR code to leave a comment and we also have paper cards available. So any questions, go ahead and And I them. also want to uh, let you know that the city manager, Mr. Eric Walsh is here uh, and uh, he's also happy to take any questions that you may have for him. Why are our, the, you have mentioned nothing about the appraisal district raising all of our property values. Sure, and I'm gonna ask Troy Elliott with our finance department, he works closely with the Bear Appraisal District to share with you how that works, how the process works. Thank you, Maria. Now, as you know, property values have increased qu quite a bit, and when you receive your notices, you're probably, probably shell-shocked by the notices. One of the things that, that we did in working with the Appraisal District and looking at values we looked at different scenarios to see how we can reduce that tax burden for the city portion of that tax bill. So to do that, as Maria mentioned, we looked at a combination of exemptions for the homestead, increasing it from that 0 0.01 to the 10%, the senior exemption and those. So we looked at developing a process to offset the tax burden that was gonna be associated with that increase in value. So when you get your um, invoices or your, for October, you should see actually that your city taxes did not go up, they may actually decrease from a tax rate standpoint. Does that help? Um, that's not probably something I can actually answer. That'd be something the, the Bear County Appraisal District would have to answer. No, ma'am. Any other questions? And just to add to what Troy mentioned, so the Bear Appraisal District is a separate entity from the city, so that is not on, under our purview. Not under the city. Uh, they're actually an independent entity. Um, they're a separate entity? Who do they answer to if they don't answer to us? They're, they're independent so that they're for a reason, so that when they actually do their evaluations on property taxes, they're not influenced from any other outside party. But they are part of the county, um, but they are an independent organization. Okay, okay. The other thing I wanted to ask, um, I thought that was wonderful that you introduced all the people that, that work for us in the city. Could we have their names and phone numbers and their job descriptions, you know, as part of you know, uh, if we need something, we know who to call on, and also how much they make. Sure, so uh, we'll In be- In dollars. <laughs> sure, sure, so a couple of things. So I'll start with the last one. All of our salaries are on the city's website, 
So if you're interested on, uh, it has our names and our position in the department that we work for, all that is public information. So that is posted annually and that is available, as I mentioned, it's on the city's website. Um, we are happy to share with you information where to call. Uh, you could also, um, to make it easy on, 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 on you and all the rest of the residents, 311 is the number to call if you have any complaints or any questions or suggestions, uh, but we'll be happy to share information on any individual department that you're interested in. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, any other questions? All right. Okay, I wrote a list. Um, I'm supportive and I would like to know what's in the budget to support the implementation of the changes coming for the noise ordinance. That's very important. It's been impacting the quality of life in many of communities and it's also been taxing our police officers to respond to those complaints. Do you have a just list of So all? Mr. Michael Shannon, who is the Director of Development Services, is coming up to, to answer that call, Bianca. Well, I guess I'll give you all your questions then, Mike. What's in the budget for short-term rental enforcement? As you know, we're not capturing all the hot tax. We've got a lot of illegal people. It is changing the essence of our single family communities with these illegal operators. And we wanna capture all that hot tax money. We wanna make sure they're all permitted. So is there money in the budget to increase the personnel to respond to that? Um, and I think it's very important. I would hope that the city would start tracking the amount of properties that short-term rentals are displacing from the rental market as we talk about the shortage of affordable housing. When we see single family homes and accessory dwelling units turning into short-term rentals, that's a loss of available housing. And when we're in a shortage of that and a crisis, I think that's important because we see a huge uptick in the STR. All right, I'm gonna try to hit all those questions. So hello everyone, I'm Mike Shannon. I'm the Director of Development Services uh, so one of the things that we have been working on for a little over a year now, which is the first question that Bianca asked, was uh, the noise ordinance. And we have been working with a noise ordinance task force along with some uh, police department, city attorney folks, but really a lot of business and neighborhood uh, residents uh, to try to figure out what changes that we can do with the noise ordinance. Should we change our city's noise code and how should we implement uh, any additional or different enforcement? The short answer is, there's no additional money set aside in the proposed budget right now uh, for additional noise enforcement. I think that was your question. Uh, but certainly the noise ordinance task force uh, process is not finished. Actually, we have a meeting uh, coming up on Tuesday night. Uh, if you want any information about that, I'll be happy to show you, uh, show you how to get uh, logged into that. Uh, we'd be happy to hear from you during that. Uh, but as that process continues, probably through the next several months, and we determine as a city what the changes, if any, are gonna be, we'll have to figure out what financial impact that would have and any additional resources. So again, nothing in the budget right, this, right now, but I guess we'll have to see what changes come up. That was part one. Part two is a short-term rental. Uh, so we do actually have additional um, short-term rental staff. I'll just refer to them as that. We have two additional proposed in the development services budget. Um, uh, and it is for that, for that reason. When we adopted the short-term rental ordinance a few years ago, uh, we had one staff member added to our team to start uh, looking at the permits issuing and try to ensure compliance. But uh, there's actually a lot more short-term rentals than there were three years ago. Uh, so we're gonna add two more additional staff, not only to review applications for permits and renewals, uh, but to make sure those uh, that maybe that are out there that are not getting permits comply uh, and we're certainly working with Troy and our finance team on any hot collections. So two additional staff. I think I got all, I think I got them, right? I wish it was four, but you know, okay. I guess we can get what we can get. I had two more questions very quickly. The city's entering the CRS program, which provides a discount to properties in the floodplain when they pull flood it, floodplain insurance. So what is in the budget to promote this discount and encourage people and educate people about the floodplain and those resources that are now available, which are new, and then also people who are not in the floodplain, maybe adjacent to it, they also get a discount too because of the new CRS program. So I'm wondering if there's any incentives in there. And then lastly, I'll leave with uh, SAPD, supportive of the increase in personnel, 
I would love to have more safe officers. I'll tell you during the pandemic, it has created more bad behavior in neighborhoods with a lot of people running stop signs. And so anything that we can do to uh, educate people about you know, their engagement with their safe officers, that would be uh, beneficial. So thank you for that. Thank you, Bianca. And Robert, would you mind coming up and sharing with uh, the community how Public Works promotes the CRS program? Hi, good evening. My name is Robert Reyna. I'm the uh, interim assistant director for Public Works. Um, my focus happens to be over stormwater, so thank you, Bianca, for asking the, that specific question. The CRS, uh, Community Rating System, this is a uh, brand new thing to San Antonio coming. Uh, it is a great program. We were finally able to get uh, ad admitted into this program. It's run by, by a branch of FEMA, right, the National Floodplain Insurance Program. They're the ones responsible for issuing flood insurance to everybody. Flood insurance does not come with your house as a standard uh, practice, right? Flood insurance is a separate animal you have to go out and purchase separately. Uh, as a stormwater person, I encourage all of you to get floodplain insurance. You should have flood insurance, whether you're in the floodplain or not. Uh, the, the, the statistics are out there. If you haven't flooded, uh, everybody goes through it at some point. So please look at getting flood insurance. now. Starting October the 1st, because the city was able to get into this program, uh, there is now going to be a 20% discount on your premiums, on your insurance premiums for those that are inside the floodplain, and then a 10% uh, discount for those that are outside the floodplain. Uh, so starting October the 1st, as your policies renew, it'll be renewed in there automatically, so you'll start seeing that in, in your bills. Now, uh, there wasn't a need uh, to include any additional cost in this year's budget for it. Uh, we have staff, uh, right now we're actually in the hiring process to hire a, a, an individual who's going to lead that uh, public outreach effort. Uh, so we, we're expecting to hire that person uh, probably at the end of this month. And so you'll start seeing a lot more uh, uh, about it. There's going to be some uh, sort of TV spots. We're going to try and publicize this as much as possible. But it is a, a great benefit for all, all the residents. And so we're happy that, that we're now part of it. Good. All right. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, yeah, I had a question regarding, um, I don't know if there's any kind of zoning or code compliance related to the parking of vehicles on very narrow streets. That causes a, a great danger. Uh, you have a lack of visibility pulling out of your street. And I, I've been often in the situation where someone comes tearing down the street and you have to stick your neck out in order to see whether or not it's safe to, to pass. Thank you. All right, so a good question uh, related to parking in the street. So um, we all probably know that normal parking on the streets, on public streets, unless there's some restriction with no parking signs that have gone through a process, it's allowed. Certainly if you have a tight street that, that's creating a dangerous situation, what I would recommend you do, you maybe, I'll, I'll talk to you if you have a specific location uh, at this meeting. You always want to call that into 311 and either code enforcement and or SAPD, we work on illegal parking, uh, whether it's illegal junk vehicles on a private property or illegal uh, long-term parking uh, in the streets. But certainly if you think you have a hazardous condition, because we do have some narrower streets in the city, uh, I would call that in either, like I said, 311 and either code enforcement or SAPD uh, will reach out to you and, and try to resolve that with you, okay? But we'll connect at the end of the meeting, okay? And then you had a question? Did anybody else have a question there? Okay. So I noticed up there on one of the slides, ARPA funding, and I know the city plans on giving a huge chunk of that, specifically $10 million of ARPA funds to Texas Biomed, a multi-million dollar organization with a disgraceful record of animal cruelty over the struggling San Antonio community. And now just recently, scandalous information affiliated with Texas Biomed has been brought to light. The director of Texas Biomed Southwest National Primate Research Center faked research data 10 different times and admittedly lied on federal grant applications. So now that the city is aware of this, is this something we're even still considering? Because I don't think we should be throwing away $10 Ten million dollars of our taxpayer dollars on ineffective animal experiments like the one Texas Biomed lies about. 
Now more than ever, we should not be giving $10 million to an organization that's betrayed the government, the scientific community, and now the San Antonio community. It's also important to know for people that don't know that Texas Biomed is a private facility. It's not even open to the public. And they already received substantial amounts of federal funds as one of seven national primate research centers in the nation. So I'm asking you, I kind of already talked to Councilwoman, but I mean, Eric, you too, you guys are high value city leaders. And um, I mean, this is not okay. This is inexcusable. And would you guys consider taking this money, withdrawing the money from Texas Biomed and instead directing that to more worthy organizations, small businesses, housing programs, and everybody immensely impacted by this pandemic that are counting on you and hoping that something's going to change before September 15th. Thank you. Thank you for that question. And just to provide some context for uh, the rest of the, the participants here tonight, uh, the city of San Antonio received um, allocation from the federal government that is called the ARPA funds, uh, specifically for fiscal local and fiscal recovery that we went through a process of identifying how to utilize those funds. So as part of that process, the city council approved what we call a spending framework in February the 2nd. And uh, the agencies um, mentioned Texas Biomed was one of the agencies that was awarded $10 million for the work that they do in San Antonio in terms of research and as one of the entities that did research on the COVID-19 uh, vaccine. So the council approved that $10 million. Uh, we uh, have executed a contract uh, for, for the distribution of those dollars so they can make improvements to their, their facility. So uh, there are no um, plans to make changes to that allocation. Uh, we have not received any, any conversations or any requests from, from the city council to that effect. You said specifically yourself, awarded. We awarded $10 million for their work. And now with this information, uh, with them faking research data, admittedly lying on federal grant applications, they torture almost 3,000 primates at that facility. They have a disgraceful record of animal cruelty and we're awarding $10 million to Texas Biomed. that I've been fighting this and y'all see me. I was yes, yesterday, I was at City Hall. I'm gonna be here September 8th and it's just me. I was on the news when I had an army because that's what people like to see. But it's just me because everyone's lost. No one believes in you guys anymore and they think you're all corrupt and I'm trying. No, and thank you for that feedback and I appreciate your coming to our community meetings and sharing your your thoughts and your concerns. And as I mentioned, we went through a process. The city council approved that allocation. There is a, a contract that has been executed for the distribution of those funds. Eric so, Bob himself at District 5 that city council has the power to reconsider ordinances. And, and they so, do, and they do. I know ARPA funds aren't just for the local community, but like I said, it's also not for throwing away $10 million on ineffective animal experiments like the one Texas Biomed falsifies. Thank you, ma'am. I'm going to take your question. Okay. Um, I have to say, when you're talking about millions of dollars here from the federal government, ultimately, that's a dribble down. That's all of our taxpayers' money that you all are using. Ought you to not to give maybe the citizens uh, maybe a voting privilege on that much money? Sure, and, and you're absolutely right. This is taxpayer dollars, and for this particular grant that the question is being asked, we went through a process we, um, there was a presentation to the city council, there was discussion by the city council, 
and there was a vote, and the vote was to award uh, funding to entities including Texas Biomed. Well, nothing is set in stone because, as I mean, we as staff cannot approve any of those contracts. We have to take those to city council. Those are public meetings. There is a process by which residents are able to provide their feedback. Every Wednesday, we have a, a process that is um, for public input, uh, and we do that for all the items. The day that an item is being considered, which is on Thursdays, there is a portion of the agenda that is, de that is dedicated to hear the community before the city council uh, approves in any type of contract. And we can connect till after, but we do have a question back here as well. So you keep repeating that there was a vote. Why can't another vote be held like in response to the new information? Is there not like a method or some clause in the contract that says, hey, if you falsify data on your grant application and we find out like you don't get that money anymore? So the council has the opportunity to reconsider ordinances. That's, that's the process that we have. Um, for this particular contract, uh, we are not aware as, as specifically to that contract that is in violation of the contract between Texas Biomed and the city of San Antonio. We have time for just one more. So falsifying data on federal grants and in order to get like money is in, in violation of the contracts that the city signs with research centers? Well, whatever allegations um, they are about this entity, as I mentioned, the, the, the award that they received from the city was to make improvements, infrastructure improvements to the facility, specifically uh, electrical improvements, HVAC improvements, uh, water um, issues that the building has. So that's what the funds were utilized for, or they're being proposed to be utilized for. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming over. We appreciate your, your feedback. And um, uh, we, again, the, the budget will be considered on September 15. And uh, there's a public hearing on the 8th uh, before the city council proposes their vote. And I see, uh, Councilman, and anything you would like to say to close the session? Thank you very much. Um, yes, thank you very much for coming out, and I was remiss in not recognizing one of our department directors who's here today, and that's uh, Ramiro Salazar from the, from the library, and um, they do a wonderful job. Thank you, Ramiro, for being here. And I also failed to mention, but it, it's very obvious, that police and fire are also here with us, so thanks a lot for, for being here, guys. One of the most important programs we have is our uh, SAFE. Uh, program everybody loves it um, all the all the neighborhoods do so thank you for for being out here um, so thanks again uh, I know it sounded like I was running a pep rally earlier and that's because every time I come here it's full of seniors that they just come here to party this is that is what this place is for for them so anyway thanks a lot uh, my team and I are here if you have uh, any questions for us so thanks a lot for coming out thank you <laughs>